Hi, welcome back to another edition of Crafting and Crime Daily with Rebecca. I'm going to recap the Thomas Randolph case from yesterday. What went on yesterday? Then we're all caught up. Did not watch Henry Dinkins' trial. The lead prosecutor, still on lead prosecutor. The lead investigator is still on the stand. So I will get caught up with that and I will bring you that tomorrow. Yes, I didn't realize how huge both of these trials are and how lengthy they would both be. But I'm okay with that. They're so interesting. Thomas Randolph is the man who took his wife out for dinner, brought her home after dinner. She goes in the house. She's shot by a burglar in a ski mask. Oh, and then Thomas goes in the house and he's confronted by the burglar. So he shoots the burglar and kills him. How convenient. So why is he on trial? He's on trial for the conspiracy to kill his wife, Sharon, for the murder of Sharon, and for the murder of Mike Miller, the burglar, who turned out to be the man's handyman, his friend that used to come over and watch baseball with him. He just shot and killed him. Ooh, that calls for coffee, doesn't it? Mm -mm -mm. So good. Okay. So before we get to that, I'm not going to cover Henry Dinkler because the lead detective is still on the stand. So yesterday I spent the entire day listening to the lead detective in the Randolph case. Both lead detectives are on the stand. Here's what I was working on last night. And I've got two more sections done. I'm going up the side. This is my logo painting. It sparkles. This, I have got, oh, look at all those. AB drills. And somebody asked me, what's an AB drill? It's just like, there are all these little diamonds. We call them drills. Some of them have an iridescent coating on them. These do here. And they make them shine really, really sparkly. Uh, let me see. This is a, these are plain, these plain drills here. Nothing, nothing unusual about them. And then these have the, the sparkle on them. You can't see it though. I know. Okay, that's what an AB is, Aurora Borealis diamond, meaning they have that coating on them and it makes, like when you hold it up to the camera, it's like, whoo, I'm blind. Yeah, that's going to be behind me once I finish up. It's my logo with the little gnome and the little popsicle, the rainbow popsicle, my nod to LGBTQ. And I did that in glow in the dark. Yeah. All right, so today we're going to talk about what happened yesterday in the Thomas Randolph trial? Interesting day. I hope the jurors were paying attention because I think this, the lead guy, Dean O'Kelly, he was also the one that was featured in the Dateline that they did about this murder. Dean O'Kelly's on the stand and he's talking about what made him suspect this was not what it seemed. Yeah. Because they think they're at a burglary that went wrong. Uh, not so fast, Dean says. Mm -mm, not so fast. So the first person on the stand yesterday was a police sergeant. He's a patrol sergeant. He's now retired. He retired as a sergeant. And I don't know what he's doing now. But these guys are good looking. Mm, calls for more coffee. Mm -mm -mm. In any case... He is, should I be diamond painting? I probably should. Oops. So he arrives on the, on the scene, this is the police sergeant, and he's not the first to get on the scene. But once he arrives on the scene, nobody can do anything until he gets there. He's the guy in charge. So he makes a decision that they're not going to run, race into this house because they don't know what they're up against. They don't know if it's one burglar or two burglars. He knew, this is what he knew. He knew that the couple had come home, the wife had been shot by the perpetrator, and then the perpetrator had been shot by the homeowner. This is what he knows. He doesn't know if there's more than one perpetrator. He doesn't know if the perpetrator's still alive. He doesn't know what he's sending his officers into. So he makes the decision to call the SWAT team. So the SWAT team, before the SWAT team can get there, you know, they're out there waiting, trying to assess the situation. They are aware that the homeowner, Thomas Randolph, is on the 911 line with 
a medical person who's attempting to walk him through CPR of his wife. They do know that that's going on, but they don't rush in because they don't know what they're rushing into. So while they're waiting for SWAT, the lieutenant shows up and he says, you know what? I think we just need to, I don't think we, I think we can handle it. I don't think we need uh, the SWAT team. We've got enough guys here. They, by then they had a couple of canines on the scene. So they put one canine officer in the back of the house in case when they entered, someone fleed out the back. So they go, put the canine officer into the back of the house. He says, I can see one, two, three, one. No, I can see two, three, and four. So what that meant was apparently SWAT has this plan when they, when they go into a place, uh, the front of the house will be side one, the back of the house is side four, and then the sides are two and three. So this canine officer, he's positioned so that he can see the back of the house and the sides. Then the other canine officer was going to go through the garage. However, before they do that, the patrol sergeant goes into the home with, he thinks four officers. He's not, he doesn't remember exactly how many went in, but they went in. They don't go through the garage. The garage door is closed. They go through the front door, which apparently was open. They go through the front door or maybe Randolph opened it for him. I don't remember. Anyway, they go through the front door. They see, they right away, they ascertain that Sharon Randolph is deceased. They, they quickly clear the house, make sure that nobody else is there, and then they, they exit. So once they, once they have determined that the homeowner is deceased, they decide they're going to go send the canine officer in with the dog to clear the rest of the house. So they're all standing outside the canine. They, all, they open the garage door. They, they see that there's a body there, the body of the burglar. Mike Miller is in the garage. The police canine clears the garage, goes in through the garage door into the house, clears the house, and then they're all able to enter. Now, of course, the defense, the, I, I'm learning this is a defense strategy. Always tell the juror how many people were at the crime scene. They contaminated the crime scene. Look at all those people. There was a a human with two legs. There was a dog with four legs, and they went through the crime scene. Now, they're very, very careful. He made, he, you know, if there was four officers that entered, then there was the canine officer, then there was the dog who's got four legs and four feet. Then, uh, you know, you got the two AMR people. Those are the two AMRs were outside. Those are the advanced medical response. Anyway, that's the ambulance guys. The, the medics, they're out there. Uh, the firefighters are out there because they, they come with the medics. Then the, uh, who else? Violent crime detectives are out there. There's regular detectives. There's uh, crime scene people. Like by, by 11 o'clock that night, this place was full of people. But they weren't going into the crime scene as, as the lead investigator is going to point out here later on. So the officers that and went in initially, the four officers, they go through the front door. So they're not going through the garage where the crime scene is, that crime scene. They do ascertain that Sharon's dead and they don't talk about what, what they saw Randolph doing. But in any case, after they determine she's dead, they, they go back out of the house. And then from that point on, only designated people can go in a certain direction. Then then once the canine clears the garage, then, the, then now, now it's all a crime scene. So what happens then is they all gather outside of the house. They're waiting for the crime scene analysts to show up on the scene. Once they show up, once everybody's there, then they have what they call a briefing to say what, what they know, what went down in the house, and then they develop a plan. Here's what we're going to do. Here's how we're going to approach this house and, and investigate this crime. Meanwhile, between the time that they initially entered to clear the house and the time that everybody shows up, which is like 11 o'clock, Thomas Randolph, meanwhile, is taken down to the police department by one of the violent crime detectives, and that's when he has his initial interview. After the interview, he is taken back to the home. 
So Dean O'Kelly is the lead detective. He is the guy that was featured on the Dateline episode. Dateline happened to catch, I don't know how they did it, but they managed to catch this crime like the night it happened. I don't know if they were following Dean O'Kelly around, but the night that they that this happened, they get involved, Dateline, and they cover the entire investigation focusing on this lead investigator, Dean O'Kelly. Dean O'Kelly traveled with his partner to I don't know, five, six, eight different states to investigate this murder. They, he investigated every one of the prior wives. Now, he wasn't allowed to say any of this on the stand. He was asked, did you do any traveling associated with your investigation of this case? And he says, yes, quite a bit. But he doesn't, he was asked, did you interview, because he said there were over 30, uh, like, full interviews. He said he Yes, he interviewed the family of Sharon's family, and he had interviewed Mike Miller's family, but they didn't ask him about the other interviews that were going on. <laughs> yeah, because he interviewed prior wives. It was all on Dateline. He interviewed prior wives. He interviewed some of the guys that said they had been groomed by Mike to kill some of the prior wives. Yeah, it was a pretty lengthy uh, Dateline, so... If you ever get a chance to watch that, I don't have the link to it. I, I, it it's not easy to find. <laughs> so I did find it and I did watch it. So Dean, Dino Kelly Hill, the, he's now retired though. He, he, although he's retired from the police department though, he still is involved. He investigates cold cases. How cool is that? Wonder if he's doing it for Dateline. So he talks about how the crime scene just didn't meet his expectations. Like once he heard what happened, because the guy that was conducting the interview while Dino Kelly's on the scene kept relaying stuff to Dino Kelly about what had happened. So when Dino Kelly actually gets into the crime scene, he says the evidence didn't fit what they were being told by Thomas Randolph. The ballistic evidence suggested that there was no shooting in that hallway, the way Thomas Randolph described to numerous people in both interviews, because he's interviewed later on, as again, a second interview, what he's telling 911. None of it jives with any of his recall of what happened that night. The ballistic evidence supports that this actually took place in the garage. He said, another thing that puzzled him is the ski mask. He said, you look at the ski mask and there's no holes in it. Said, Mike Miller was shot in the head by Thomas Randolph. And he was wearing the ski mask when he was shot in the head. So who took the ski mask off of him? Where's the holes in the ski mask? There's no tissue, no blood, no holes, nothing on the ski mask. Then he has the black bags near him in the garage. And one of those black bags was, was a Walmart bag. And inside that Walmart bag, there was all this stuff. So what they did was when they got back to the police department, they laid all of the stuff out and they photographed. It. And in the bottom left hand of the photograph, you can see four keys. The first key unlocked the back of the house and the front of the house. So now we know how he got in. The back door was open. He, he got in through the back door. He had the key. One was to a safe that was in the master bedroom closet that I don't think was ever accessed. And then two were high security keys that he, they never figured out what those went to. The 38 special that was used to kill Sharon Randolph was found next to her body. Several times, Thomas Randolph says, when I knelt down next to her body, I was kneeling on the gun. 
Yet, during his version of the story, he's confronted by Mike Miller, who has a different gun. He has a, he has a gun in his hand. Not, now, we know that the gun that was used to kill Sharon is a thirty eight, and it was sitting next to her body. Why would he... What, the gun that was found next to Mike Miller once he was gunned down by Thomas Randolph was a twenty two which is not as powerful as the 38. So why would he put the 38 down next to her body and then go get a 22? That makes no sense. And there were a lot of other guns found in that house. Oh, during Thomas Randolph's rendition of the story, he says while he was on the phone with 911, and you, we heard the 911 tape, that they're, they keep trying to get him to give his wife CPR. And he's like, shouldn't I go get the gun? They're like, what gun? The the gun that the burglar had. Should I should I try to find it? And they're like, okay, go. Oh, but no, you should be doing CPR on your wife. So he goes out to the garage, and he finds finds the gun that's underneath Mike Miller's body. He picks it up. He leaves the garage. He says he locked the garage door so that. Mike couldn't get back in the house. Then he takes the gun and he tosses it into what he says he thought he was tossing it into a wastebasket. It ended up, it was inside, it found inside of a piece of luggage. Isn't that weird? Yeah. Now, here's some other puzzling things that Dino Kelly said happened. Sharon Randolph at autopsy had this gorgeous jewelry on. She still had all her jewelry on. Mike Miller didn't take any of her jewelry. At the scene, her purse was lying near her body. It was open and there was a visible, right at the top of the purse was a $100 bill. He didn't take that. Then O'Kelly says, you know, it didn't make sense that when the burglar was confronted by Thomas Randolph, that he ran towards the garage to leave. Why didn't he run towards the back door the way he came in? It would have made more sense for her, him to run that direction instead of running towards the garage. Then there was this fire extinguisher that they found on the floor of the garage. And it looked like it was still had the bracket around it. And it looked like it had been attached to the wall. You could see the screw on the wall that had been holding it there. And Thomas Randolph's version of the story, he, at some point, he's, when he's in the garage doing whatever he was doing in the garage, he heard a loud noise. And he later learned that it was this fire extinguisher falling off the wall. Well, T Dino Kelly tried to recreate this fire extinguisher falling off the wall the wall he there was a refrigerator right next to it and he bumped and he kept running into the refrigerator and this he couldn't get this fire extinguisher to fall off the wall so what was going on in that garage that caused that fire extinguisher to come off you know the bracket to come out of the wall onto the garage floor he said the garage was very tidy for a garage except for this fire extinguisher that was on the floor so there were also different versions in thomas randolph's story about where Mike Miller had the gun when he was confronted. So Mike Miller run, you know, the, Thomas Randolph runs into Mike Miller and starts shooting him. He says Mike Miller has the gun in his right hand. And then later on, he says, oh no, he was fumbling around for something in his waistband. So did he see a gun or did he not see a gun? I don't know. Then he says, there was a question about whether the garage door was open or closed. Now, if that garage door was not propped open and it had closed automatically, when he was confronted by the burglar who was running towards that garage door and he starts shooting him, there would have been ballistic evidence in that door because the wounds that Mike Miller suffered were penetrating wounds, meaning they went through his body and out the other side. So it would have hit that door. 
were somewhere in the vicinity of that door, and there's no evidence that that door was closed. It's someone propped that garage door open. Then at some point during the 911 call, Thomas Randolph says that he's in the garage, the light went out in the garage, and it startled him when the light went out. So Dino Kelly conducted several tests, and it, on each test, the light goes off automatically after the garage doors are closed for five minutes and eight seconds. So there was that went into a lot of the timing. So then they went through the timeline of events. So at 8.20 p.m., you can see they show footage from the hotel the casino where they went for dinner, the lobby. And you can see Sharon and Thomas leaving the casino. Once they leave the casino, you can, they, there's surveillance footage in the parking lot. You see them exiting in, into the parking lot. So it's 8.20 p.m. when they leave the restaurant. Then they go to a place called Funny's Gas Station where they, he fills up with gas. That's at 8.26 p.m. And from Funny's, it would take three to four minutes for Thomas Randolph to get from the gas station to his home. That would have put the arrival at the home at 8.30, around 8.30. So at 8.33, we know the neighbor gets a phone call and he hears, time, simultaneous to getting that phone call, he hears gunshots coming from Thomas Randolph's home. So if you assume that he arrived home at 8.30, you know, if, if he left from the time he leaves Funnies, if you go forward three to four minutes, you assume that, because he says he, he entered the garage, you know, he let Sharon out because she wouldn't have fit in the garage. So he pulls into the garage. She goes in through the garage door. He doesn't hear any shooting because he's got the radio playing. He's hard of hearing. It's, it's a song that he liked. He's listening to the song. Then he closes the garage door. Well, if you add five minutes and eight seconds to that, the time it would have taken the light to go out in the garage, it would have been dark way before Randolph describes when it did go dark, when the light actually went out. I hope that made sense. I think it made, in my head, it made sense. Okay. These were all things that were bothering Dino Kelly. So one of the other things that was bothering him is, is it's not till he's on that 911 call for six minutes before he starts compressions on his wife. The guy kept asking him to start compressions, but he, you know, he needed to go get the gun and he needed to do this. Should I open the front door for the police? Yes, you should go, go open the front door. It was weird. It was weird. Oh, also, it wasn't until 944 that he calls 911. Or 844. 844 when he calls 911. So if they arrive home at 830, 833 when the neighbor heard the gunshots, he doesn't call 911 till 844. What is he doing? In any case, the next thing they do is they go through all of the life insurance policies. I didn't know there were so many. There was a chase policy that was taken out in January of 06, and that was $200,000, where Thomas Randolph was the sole beneficiary. Then the next month, February of 2006, they weren't even married then. He, put, he was put on the application as a domestic partner. This was a prudential life insurance, and it was $100,000 paid to the sole beneficiary, Thomas Randolph. Then they found a Stonebridge life insurance policy for $10,000. Again, Thomas Randolph, beneficiary. And then they found a Boston life insurance policy, which was one that she had through her employer, where she named him as a sole beneficiary. That was another $22,000. So all told, Thomas Randolph got $332,000. He applied for the benefits in June or July. So within a month or two after the killing of Sharon Randolph, he applies for these benefits. So the last thing they, they 
or where I ended the testimony yesterday was they were getting ready to show the actual second interview that Dean O'Kelly participates in. We've already seen the first interview. So yesterday we, we got to see, hear the 911 call again. We got to see a lot of the surveillance showing them at the casino and at the gas station. So now we're going to hear what this guy had to say during the second interview. The other thing Dean O'Kelly was talking about was, you know, where did you guys get this idea to do this video walkthrough one week later? And he says, this, it's, a, it's something we normally do with like police involved shootings because, and, he, and I, we learned a lot about this when we, when I covered the Parkland school shooter and the officer, the school resource officer was on trial. We learned about how you get it when you're in these intense situations, you get tunnel vision, you have auditory exclusion where there's things you don't, you know, that are being heard, but you don't hear them. So he thought, you know, usually an officer involved shootings like that, they, they will walk the officer have them walk through actually the actual shooting. And then at the, this, it's at this point that they start remembering these things that were excluded because of the adrenaline rush. So they, he got the idea, well, let's get this guy to do a video walkthrough. And maybe there, maybe there are, all, are things that he will remember that he didn't tell us during the interview, but his, his version never wavered. <laughs> he, he maintained his version, you know, through the first interview, through the walkthrough, we're going to see the second interview, and uh, then I'll tell you if he maintained his version through the, the second interview as well. Yeah, and is he going to take the stand in his own defense? I don't know. Is this their last witness? Is the lead investigator the last witness? I don't think we've heard from the medical examiner. I don't know if we will, because that I, I'm interested in, you know, the directionality of the bullets and where they were shot and you know it, it has to make sense right and right now thomas randolph's version of the events is not making any sense and i hope the jurors see that even without the knowledge remember yesterday most you guys were so honest when you said oh no we wouldn't look at no no we're jurors we're not gonna look at you guys would make great jurors i would make a lousy juror based on my answer but in any case that's the show for the day. I'm going to catch you up on Henry Dinkins tomorrow. We'll see what we can see from this interview. I'm getting ready to have some coffee and finish my coffee and listen to it. And I hope you have a great Tuesday. I'll see you tomorrow then. Bye, everybody.